we go. Here we are. It's 7.30. Uh, we'll begin the meeting. The mayor is going to join us on the phone, I believe, and so unfortunately I'm in charge of this uh, this morning, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, Mike, will you get us started off? We have uh, a few items on the agenda. Number one is the individual evaluation appeals, and what we'll do is just go through one by one. And then if we have somebody online or obviously in person, then they can get up and speak, and then uh, we'll speak. So go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank sure, you. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. You don't yet have a quorum for for the meeting without the mayor on the line. So can we check and see if the mayor is online or if uh, Commissioner Preston or Commissioner Gary are? So the mayor is online. So then, so do we need to call roll? Hey, I'm online. Gotcha, mayor. So do we need to call roll? Not a good idea. That might be a good idea just to indicate availability. Shelly, we call the roll, please. Thank you, Nancy. Gary. Pepcorn. Here. Preston. Strand. Here. Mahoney. Here. Very good. We have a quorum present, so now we will begin again. Go ahead, Mike. Good morning. Uh, this meeting is to review and take action on the appeals that we received on the valuation this year and to finalize and certify the 2022 assessment. Just a reminder that the board may take whatever uh, <clears throat> excuse me, adjustments it deems necessary to ensure that the assessment is equalized and uniform. We do have an, uh, some people in person that wish to address the board as well as some virtually. So I suggest that uh, we proceed with the agenda as presented here before you. So go ahead, I think then what we'll do is just go one by one if that's okay with you. Uh, and so if you don't mind starting us out with the first one, 3737. 44th Avenue North. Okay, and if there's anybody with, uh, present that wishes to speak to this. If you want to come up, just go ahead, uh, use that podium, and if you don't mind introducing yourself, we'd appreciate that. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is James Polianski. I re represent uh, Amazon. Uh, we uh, occupy the facility um, subject property that's uh, that's been mentioned at uh, 3737 44th Ave um, just north of town it's a large facility and uh, uh, the underlying point of contention is um, the fair market value of the subject property for um, uh, 2022 tax year uh, I do have supporting documentation for our case. I'd like to provide that to you, but I have to apologize in advance. I've made one copy short, so if you don't mind sharing, is that okay? No, that's fine. Thank you. Does he have one, Mike, do you have one? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. If I may uh, direct the Honorable Board to <clears throat> assessment documentation provided, uh, the uh, I'll go I'll go very quick uh, uh, in as much as possible. Um, if if I may refer to your your attention to page um, A two or just page two. Uh, the subject property is uh, a million square foot or almost 1.1 million square foot uh, building, uh, ground floor plus 250,000 square foot mezzanine space uh, located or situated on 107 acres uh, just uh, on the north end of um, uh, Fargo. And uh, the property was just uh, recently built, and this is the first year that it's being fully assessed. Um, the primary point of contention is um, the racking uh, that's uh, that's been classified as real property, and uh, um, <coughs> um, the, the type of racking that Amazon uses is uh, fairly advanced, and, and so it's, uh, it's 
it sits on top of the mezzanine area and you could walk on top of it. And there are uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, vertical, uh, res the assessor refers to it as elevators, but it's, but it's uh, vertical uh, machines that uh, go up and down in order to uh, deliver uh, pallets uh, to the upper levels. Um, so from the taxpayer's perspective, the uh, racking uh, on top of the mezzanine, uh, including these uh, VRCs um, and, and other items, is considered personal property. Uh, and um, we do not feel that it's subject to uh, assessment. And uh, so that's uh, uh, point of contention number one. The second uh, issue is uh, classification of the quality of the building. And uh, and from that, uh, the valuation stems. Um, <clears throat> to further support that uh, uh, racking shouldn't be considered part of the square footage of the building, uh, on page A7, this is uh, a building sketch that's provided. It's it's not the best quality, <clears throat> but you could somewhat make out if you put it uh, sideways um, the ground floor square footage of about one million eighty thousand square feet, and then two hundred and fifty thousand and uh, looks like thirteen um, square feet for the mezzanine space, um, excluding of the um, uh, of the racking area. Uh, and so looking at the uh, valuation of the property, uh, appraisal institute and, and uh, appraisal body recommends employing uh, three approaches to value, cost, income, and sales. Um, both income and, and sales approaches are uh, difficult in, in this town simply due to the uh, sheer size of the subject property. And so primary uh, approach to value that, that we've looked at is uh, the cost approach based on the Marshall and Swift uh, valuation service. And uh, <clears throat> referring to the quality of the building, uh, this is a, uh, an average quality uh, facility uh, supporting uh, that position is based on the uh, cost manuals uh, that, that I've uh, copied for your reference on page uh, A11 and uh, of average quality um, with a 3950 as the base cost. Um, Assessor has the building at good quality, which would include uh, additional uh, features to the building, including kitchen, uh, decorative walls, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we, do not, um, we, we do not have that. Um, as such, uh, I'm not going to go through uh, the math here, but uh, the base cost is then adjusted for um, for the height, uh, clear height of uh, 40 feet, uh, local and current multipliers are applied, and that gives us an adjusted base cost of 65.25 per square foot, multiplied by uh, 1,080,000 square foot building with a building base cost of 70 million. And then to that, we add uh, additional features such as uh, the mezzanine area of 250,000 square feet, um, cooling, um, uh, and then the sprinkler system for 1.3 million square feet. Now, with, with reference to the sprinkler system, uh, the sprinkler system runs uh, throughout the building. It includes the mezzanine area plus the racking portion as well. Uh, we have a lot of product there. And, and so, God forbid it catches fire, that needs to be suppressed. Uh, the nuance is that uh, the fire sprinkler system 
that's in the mezzanine area would stay with the building once, if and when we leave. And so that, that is to be considered real property. The sprinkler system that is part of the racking system is going to be taken out and that shouldn't be considered as, as real property, uh, but rather M&E or, or machinery and equipment. <clears throat> uh, the rest of the um, uh, cost approach is, um, is adding for uh, extra features, uh, much of which is on the assessor's cost approach, which is provided for you on the uh, subsequent page. Um, the only um, deduction or, or exclusion that I have made is for the um, um, for those freight elevating units that are to be also taken out uh, once we uh, leave the facility. <clears throat> um, and then that uh, just one year's worth of uh, depreciation is applied. And, um, and then land value added to that. Uh, there's a substantive difference in the uh, land value opinion. Um, the assessor's office has land value at um, at eight million, I believe. Yeah, I, I didn't print out that portion, but I believe it's at eight million. Uh, we, th we think it's closer to uh, 4.1 million, uh, simply that's the, because that's the amount that we, uh, um, or our developer paid for the land. Uh, reconciled and depreciated um, cost approach arrives at a value of uh, 96 million or approximately $89 a square foot. And then we ask the city to, um, uh, and the assessor's office to review that and, and recognize those uh, changes. The rest of the information provided is uh, simply supporting documentation for, um, for the cost approach and the basis of the cost um, that was used. That would be all. I will entertain any questions that there are. Are there any questions? Commissioner Strand. Thank you. I'm just really curious. Um, when you're talking this racking system, yes. do you depreciate it out or expense it? Um, uh, where? In the cost approach? In your, in, your, in, your cost, in your accounting systems, when you invest in a racking system, is it a depreciable uh, item or is it an expense? Um, in the, I, I frankly don't know. Um, I, I would assume that it's depreciated uh, simply because its life is greater than a year. So wouldn't, so, wouldn't that suggest it's a built-in fixture to the physical property? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, the whole notion of uh, uh, fixture... Uh, that might not be the right word, yeah. fixture, but, but if you're depreciating it out, it's part of the construct. Yeah, well, we, we depreciate trucks. It's not real estate. Okay. We depreciate uh, forklifts. Yep. It's not real estate. Um, simply, uh, simply because uh, equipment is being depreciated doesn't necessarily make it uh, uh, part of real estate. <clears throat> uh, there are th three prongs that determine, that the courts have determined, uh, uh, that are indicators for what is real estate and what is personal property. Uh, and uh, the assessor's office and I had a, a, an extensive conversation about this, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a summary version. Um, so when, uh, in the appraisal industry, when the concept of a, f a fixture or when something becomes real estate is, uh, is taught, uh, it, very uh, simple examples are used. And in other words, when something is attached to a building um, that is uh, real estate, if something is 
detached, but inside the building that becomes personal property. That, uh, and that kind of makes rational sense. But uh, real life is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, so for example, uh, these extra uh, uh, lights, are, are they real estate or are they fixture, uh, or, or are they personal property? Uh, I would argue that these lights are uh, uh, personal property uh, because A, the, uh, their useful life is a lot shorter than the rest of the building, A. B, it's a specific feature for, uh, for a unique use of the premises etc and so the three uh, prongs to determine whether something whether something is real estate or personal property is a uh, um, <clears throat> affixation as we were saying so how solidly or how permanently something is attached to the building now the word permanence means uh, not only whether it's uh, how uh, solidly it's attached but also with the duration of time and so, uh, for example, generators are very solidly attached. They're on concrete pads, uh, but uh, uh, that is something that's required for the generator <clears throat> to operate uh, when it's working so it doesn't uh, slide off uh, and, and, and move around. So it's, it's permanently attached and affixed uh, to a con concrete pad. Um, <clears throat> the other uh, uh, aspect is adaptability or prong. Uh, it's an ab adaptability. In other words, will another user be able to utilize those unique features for their alternate use? And, and in our case, uh, that is very unlikely because we follow a, a very unique storing uh, system that is uh, uh, from my experience, and I've been working from, uh, for Amazon for quite a while, and I've know, I know what other um, uh, e-commerce uh, operators are using uh, as far as their uh, storage uh, methods and, and storage systems, and neither Walmart nor Wayfair or, or other companies would be able to adapt uh, uh, our racking to their use. Um, and then the third um, prong is what uh, do the two parties, landlord, <coughs> landlord and tenant, how do they see the issue? And in our case, uh, A, based on the, um, uh, at the very least, based on that uh, building sketch that's provided that shows the square footage of the building, but uh, also uh, uh, in a formal agreement with the landlord right through the lease uh, we need to clear everything out including the vrcs which are those the re reciprocating uh, uh, specialty uh, lift uh, systems including the racking including the um, fire suppression system that's in the racking we need to take it out of the building when we leave the landlord doesn't want it and that speaks volumes as far as uh, um, what the two parties or how the two parties sees uh, uh, those items. Um, can I so ask you? Hopefully can, that answers your you. question. Can, can I ask you a question? So, uh, and we've gotten to go through the building and so uh, it's, okay. it's amazing. So you're telling me that the whole mezzanine would be removed if you left the building? So there are two aspects to the mezzanine. Um, so there's the concrete mezzanine, and on top of the concrete mezzanine, there are those storage platforms right. that, so the mezzanine, uh, it, um, it has a, a steel core, and then poured concrete on top and level. On top of that, there are bolted uh, racking system uh, that go up another level uh, that have, uh, um, I believe it's, plywood or particle board that you could walk on. And but so uh, the concrete mezzanine would be would remain with the building. The elevated uh, uh, system that's on top of the me uh, concrete mezzanine, that would all be taken out. But to me, that goes to the, that's why it's included. That mezzanine level, that's 
that's part of the building, isn't it? I mean, if it's cement, poured cement, you're not going to remove that out of the building when you leave. Cause right. That, that is correct. And, that, and, and, and that's why in the analysis, we are including that portion in the valuation. What the assessor's office is doing is adding the racking square footage on top of that. So if I may refer your attention to page A9, uh, halfway through the page, there are two um, references for mezzanine storage. The first one is for 250,000 square feet, and that's the concrete uh, mezzanine. The second for 239 or 240,000 rounded square feet, that's the, uh, uh, that's the racking system. And so the, the, the racking system should not be part of uh, real estate. Okay, so, and I think we'll just have you remain sure. here, and so we'll have Mike go next, and then if there is any follow-up, we'll do it that way, if that's okay with you, because yes, unless you have, any, have anything. Mr. And, Chairman? Yep, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I'd uh, make a motion to do the recommended action. I understand his explanation, but our assessors went through this as well, and they did do a reduction, so I'd make a motion to the recommended action. I appreciate that. Uh, but I think we'll let Mike speak first, and then we'll follow up. Is that is I, John? Does that sound like we're doing the correct thing? Even though he made a motion, technically you should probably call for a second, and then that'll open debate. Okay. Do we have a second on the motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion. And now, if it's okay, we'll have Mike, uh, and then we can follow up if we need to. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. So you have the uh, page for the Amazon before you, and our write-up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Pol Polensky's time um, in dealing with this. Um, we did ask for a walkthrough of the Amazon again here on Friday, and uh, we were able to walk through it because we did have some questions. The questions that he brought up, we wanted to address them and just get a little more information. Um, some of these things, it comes down to a difference of opinion. Um, we did look at the grade of the building and uh, we did have it uh, graded as a good. Uh, uh, however, with Marshall and Swift in our system, there are steps in between uh, where basically the idea is it, does it exactly match up to the, the description from the book or is it somewhere in between there? And that was one of the things that we did want to verify. And uh, in our opinion, it falls somewhere in between that average and good. And so uh, we did adjust that. Uh, the other thing that we did, if you look in your right up there in paragraph four, is we did remove the vertical reciprocating conveyors because we um, are not convinced, again, that that is uh, you know, uh, really a, a permanent fixture to the building. It is attached. Um, but in talking with the manager out there, they said that it is something that if theoretically they didn't needed to remove it, they could do it in a relatively timely manner without interrupting their their workflow terribly. So uh, we did decide to remove that um, as a uh, make it more of a personal property type thing. With the mezzanine, um, so we're talking about a two tiered mezzanine. The uh, you've got your ground floor, and then you have a that first tier, which is the has the six to eight inch concrete bed on it, um, definitely a permanent fi fixture uh, according to our understanding of what this comes. And then above that, a, a second tier of what he's calling the rack shelving. Now, as far as the construction of the rack shelving, it does look very similar to rack similar, or, or it is rack shelving. However, it becomes a question of the permanence. Um, there is a structural component to it in that it's not um, uh, structural to the building itself but it is uh, holding a certain amount of weight. And the other thing is, in order to remove the shelving, uh, you've got electrical running through there in conduits, and you have the, uh, the sprinkler system going through there. Um, uh, our, our understanding of the permanence of the building, and whether it's personal property or if it's actually part of the building itself, is if you were to remove this from the building, would it be a gross interruption of, you know, the the of the overall setup? Is it going to really set things back? Is it going to be a major operation to remove this from the building? 
In our opinion, in order to remove all of that electrical, all of the piping for the, the sprinklers, it would be a major operation. It would not happen quickly. And so in our opinion, it is a part of the real estate. It is attached to the building. Um, and then the last thing I would say, as far as the land goes, yes, they paid about $4 million for the land, but that was raw land without any uh, in, in, uh, improvements to the land, any uh, drainage brought in, uh, uh, any improvements to make the site suitable for building on. And so uh, in order to um, you know, recognize that the site has been improved to a buildable uh, state, we do have it. Uh, valued at $1.75 per square foot. The, the raw land itself was $0.77 cents per square foot when they bought it before they did, did any improvements to it. So at this point, with the adjustments that we've made for the differences that we saw in walking through it, uh, we have uh, suggested before you that it was the initial valuation we came up with is $123 million, and we're suggesting uh, that we adjust it down to 119 million for the differences. Can, can I just add one thing, and then uh, Commissioner Strand? So, so then I, I think the other key numbers are the sale price was 1210 of 21, 202 million, and then obviously the, the Amazon perspective, uh, what what their number is 96 million 852 thousand. So those are kind of the that's I would say those are the other key numbers that were involved in it. So Commissioner Strand. Thank you, Mr. Polyatsky. Am I saying that correctly? Uh, very well. Thank you. Um, is that Polish? Uh, that is Polish, yes. It is Polish. There's a little community of Warsaw, North Dakota. That's our little Polish community. You've, you've got a lot of Amazon facilities and, and centers around the country. Initially, of course, we're delighted Amazon's here. We're honored that to be a partner for, for years and years going forward. What's your experience been in other uh, locations with this? I'm sure you've had this topic multiple times. How has it shaken out? Um, so we, we have multiple types of buildings and for uh, uh, different uh, types of facilities, there are different issues that we encounter. So for, uh, for this specific uh, facility, this is called, it's called a um, uh, non-sortable fulfillment center because it doesn't have robotics uh, inside. Um, and uh, we have um, approximately 20 of this type of, uh, or this um, generation of a building. Um, and so most of the time, the issue doesn't come up uh, because uh, most states uh, tax personal property and we put the racking component onto the personal property return and and so the, the issue is never raised because it's accounted for on the personal property return um, in other states such as Ohio um, where personal property is not taxed um, and merely having a conversation with the assessor uh, uh, and then walking through the building, the, the issue went away with the assessor recognizing that it's, uh, that it's a feature that's not going to last the entirety of um, the life of the building. Uh, with respect to um, uh, permanence of the, um, of the uh, racking system and, and ability to, um, uh, to take it out, uh, we did have uh, a, uh, an, a case where uh, our lease was up. Uh, this was in Reno, Nevada, uh, that had similar style racking. And, and, and so the lease was being renewed. The landlord wanted a significant uh, increase in the rent. And, and so we decided not to renew uh, the lease and went down the street to a similar building and, and leased that facility. And so within about two months, that system, the racking system, was taken out and erected again in, uh, at a nearby facility. So um, uh, this whole concept of uh, substantiality and, and um, 
uh, how long it takes something to be either taken out uh, is is a relative term, right? So, uh, for example, right, the, the, the values that we're talking about um, is relative to an overall value of the facility of about 100 million. The, the, the time component of how long it takes something to take out of a building is relative to how long it took to build the facility, which approximately more than a year, right? A year and a half or so. Um, and so uh, if it takes two months to uh, take out that portion of, uh, of the wrecking system and erect it somewhere else relative to its construction time, let's say rounded a year and a half, that's, that's a relatively short time period. Um, as far as the uh, difficulty of uh, uh, severing um, lights and, and fire suppression system, uh, Again, relatively speaking, it's pretty simple. You just cut it off uh, and, and cap um, uh, the pipes and, the, and the, the extra electrical features. So I, um, I don't think it's, uh, um, it's, it's an easy process when, when, when comparing to, your, to reinstalling your kitchen sink. Uh, but relative to the type of facility this is, right, 1.3 million square feet, um, and um, two months isn't isn't a very long time. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I, I don't I don't know if anybody I, I don't know if either side has any th any other points they wish to add. Otherwise, uh, we will be taking uh, taking the roll. If if is everyone else ready? Are there any other questions? Okay, roll call, please. Mahoney? Aye. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Very good. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And we'll move on. And I guess in the sake of interest, would you rather just go in order or should we see if there's anybody else that is either online to, uh, or how would you care to do this, Mike? Should we just go in order? Um, yeah, it might, might be easier just to go in Okay. Then moving on to... Thank um, you. Go ahead. Thank you. So, so then we're moving on to 12, 11, 47 Street South. Is that correct, Mike? Yes. Very good. Proceed, please. Okay. And if there's anybody online who wishes to address this property. Yes. Um, I'm Stacy Clair. I'm the representative um, for this property. I'm online. So Would you, you like me to go first? If you don't mind, go ahead, please. Yep. Okay, yes, for sure. Um, so this is um, an industrial property located out 121 147th Street South. And um, do you, um, I did send in my um, information, my documentation. I don't know if they, you know, printed them out and brought them. That way you guys have some sort of visual by chance? The, uh, the commissioners have it in front of them. Okay. Uh, yep. So um, I just, um, I guess I'll just go straight into um, um, page number three, um, where you can see um, the comparable assessments analysis um, where I found similar um, properties um, within proximity of the subject property. Um, in there, I've highlighted. Um, you know, the total value and total square foot of the surrounding properties um, in relation to the subject property, which you could see is, um, you know, significantly less around the high 70 Austin square foot range. Um, and um, we are being at the um, I did do a little bit of adjustments, age and size, um, um, so they were pretty similar in um building area age, so there wasn't much, much adjustment needed. Um, um, for this um, portion of the analysis, I did just go ahead and reconcile to the average of $73 a square foot. Um, I'll move on, go ahead and move on to the income approach. I did perform an income analysis. Um, you can see the pro forma on the next page, page <coughs> four. 
um, where I used a seven dollars and thirty cents um, lease rate, um, a conservative five percent vacancy, um, and my um, support for that information is on the next three pages, um, where my lease comps. I have four lease comps, um, three of which are very local. Um, you're saying as close to size and age, um, I did, you know, make the necessary adjustments um, needed. Um, and so, therefore, I did reconcile to $7.30 um, for my lease rate. Um, overall, both um, income and uniformity approach come to be around $72 or $73 a square foot. So, I did just reconcile to the higher end. That range to a vested value of seven million four hundred and fifty thousand, or seventy-three dollars a square foot. Um, that's basically. I know I kind of went through that fast, but you can see um, that information there. Um, you know, all the all the comps that I found within that are in close proximity with the subject property are very low compared to the subject property. So um, we just think that. Um, you know, seventy three dollars a square foot, or seven hundred and forty, hundred fifty dollars, seven million four hundred fifty thousand is closer to the most appropriate market value. Thank you very much. And so, sure. Mike, Mike, will you? Yep. Uh, I guess I should say, do we have any questions? Uh, otherwise, we can maybe have Mike speak, and then we'll have questions after that. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, so the property before you, uh, uh, you have the write-up, and the, I guess the one thing we would say is that um, for the income approach, we don't have a lot of information. It's the same old story with us here, is we just don't get that information to be able to verify whether it's market or not. Um, I, I understand that her in, her income approach is, uh, she, she got this information, um, um, but it doesn't, um, uh, it, it looks as, uh, as as if some of the adjustments are are uh, not quite right for uh, our local market, um, and it, again, we're not able to verify that with any uh, transactions that are happening in our market, um, other than and her le her lease rates themselves. Uh, the cap rates we're not sure of. Um, we're not sure of the uh, vacancy rates or anything along those lines. Um, there also uh, was a certain amount of square footage that was omitted from the, uh, the approach. And so um, what we're doing is we're basing our valuation off of the sales that we have, that you have before you, um, showing that um, the, uh, the subject property is at $95 a square foot, and um, that's right in the range of the sales that we have here. It's a, a little on the upper end, but it's not out of the range that we have. As far as the competing properties, uh, we have that down on the right up before you there. We have 35 such properties um, showing that uh, the median is right at the $95 per square foot. So, um, you know, as far as the immediate properties around, um, we we don't necessarily just look at the immediate properties. We're going to look at the that type of property uh, throughout the city um, if it's comparable because we have a, a small enough market range when it comes to the uh, warehousing type industrial types um, we're pretty much able to uh, look throughout the city there's not really one area or another that's significantly stronger than you know than another when it comes to the industrials so we're saying that um, you know based off of this information that I have in front of you uh, it is equalized and uniform. Do we have any comments? Sorry, do we have any comments or questions from anybody or, or uh, the mayor on the phone? If we don't, uh, then we could uh, have a motion if we're ready. I move Who's the recommended motion? We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I think we'll do roll call again. Roll call, please. Mahoney? Here. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Very good. Moving on. The next item on the agenda is 1602 45th Street North. And I don't know if we have uh, any... that... 
begin. <laughs> I'm representing both properties. Go ahead then. Um, okay, so um, it's um, pretty much the same analysis that I performed on this property as well. Um, um, I performed a uniformity approach. Um, so you'll see that on the third page um, again, um, where you know, I looked at close proximity um, compared to the subject property. Um, again, they are just lower in assessments compared to the subject property. Didn't make um, the appropriate adjustments for those. Um, these um, comparable assessments kind of average out to be $76 a square foot. So that is what I reconciled to you for this portion of the analysis. Um, the income approach, um, you know, I, I did get similar information because they are both located in um, the same area. So um, my cap rate and reserves are basically the same um, for this Fargo industrial um, submarket. But my leases, um, I did find leases um, for this property um, that are close in size and age. Um, for this location, um, I did apply $6.42 six dollars and 42 cents lease rate um all of these um leases um are located in fargo um and like i said they are similar in size and age but the appropriate adjustments were made um as needed um therefore um the income approach did come to sixty dollars sixty two dollars and sixty four cents um, or four million six hundred and forty thousand and the uniformity approach came to seventy six dollars and um, per square foot and um, or a total of five million six hundred and thirty thousand. So I just go ahead and just um, am requesting on the upper end of that range um, at the seventy six dollars a square foot. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, so on this property, uh, just a couple of things to note. We do have sales that support it and also you have before you the uh, uniformity. Uh, one thing to note is that they do have a large amount of land, which we would call excess land, <clears throat> um, which uh, potentially could be uh, split off and developed uh, by a separate property. And so um, one, if, if for comparison with the, the last one we just talked about, we had the build, just the building value at eight. <coughs> excuse me, at $86 per square foot, and we have this one at $73 per square foot. So just recognizing that part of this overall value is that land value in itself, and uh, land value is land value. We can't do a lot about it. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments or questions from anybody? Are we ready for a motion? <laughs> Go ahead. If not... We will uh, have a have a motion. Mr. Chairman, move to approve the recommended action. Thank you. We have we have we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston. Aye. Mahoney. Aye. Strand. Yes. Pepcorn. Aye. Very good. Moving on to 1602 40. Oh, no, I'm sorry about that. I haven't been checking these off. 4014 17th Avenue South. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay, if there's anybody uh, present that wishes to speak to this property. Yes, this is Mayor from O'Connor and Associates. I'm going to represent the next three properties. Go ahead. You can start, and then we'll have Mike. So go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Um, so this is the Candlewood Suites on uh, 4014. 17th Lake Avenue. This is a 96 room hotel property built in 2015. Um, as you can see, there, uh, I've given you three years of the revenue 2021, 2020, and 2019. Using the 2021 income, uh, subtracting 70% and 5% uh, of, of the replacement for reserves and a cap rate of 8.5%, that's depending on a class of the hotel. Um, the the, uh, the adjusted market value comes out to three million six hundred to eighty thousand. If you look at this, uh, page two, this is a three-year stabilized like income approach. Um, 
the 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 three year the average is a million six hundred sixty six thousand, and uh, same expenses, same replacement for reserves, same cap rate, comes out to three million one hundred and ten thousand. The page three is the actual P and L of this property. Um, we we use like the actual expenses and uh, the the income as well. So if you're using the actual P&L, the adjusted market value with the same cap rate comes out to four million two hundred thousand. Now, page four is my equity analysis. This is uh, value per room analysis. Our 2022 notice for the subject is four four million nine hundred sixty one thousand, and the number of rooms are ninety six. If you divide the 2022 value by the number of rooms, it gives you the value per room at fifty one thousand six eight two. Now, the next five are the comparable properties, same class hotels. The median of those value per room is 39796 If you take the median and and take the number of rooms from the subject property, the adjusted market value is 3820426 which is my opinion of value for this property. And um, the, next, the next three pages, the next four pages you will see are the actual P&L uh, profit and loss statements of the Candlewood Suites. Um, I've also had another big packet that I had included, which was the 82-page packet, which is a supporting evidence for the cap rates, the intangible business value, which is uh, the franchise value of this property, which is not taxable, um, and uh, the expense ratios for all class hotels uh, throughout the region. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And Mike, before you start, mind me asking, so obviously the last couple of years for hotels were very difficult and then for them to show, you know, I'm sure the, the income was just, uh, you know, obviously very difficult, but that's kind of out of our control. Yeah. And I will say the good news is hotels now have rallied very well. So they're, they're all doing much better now. So can you talk a little bit about that? If it's in your report, that's good. And I apologize for getting out of order, but thank you. Sure. Uh, last year, we did do a reduction of uh, 15% for all hotels and motels throughout the city of Fargo, and that was for market itself. Um, and, I mean, at that point, <clears throat> what we were acknowledging is that our valuations were high at that point, and we were higher than the market, so that's why we, that's why we dropped them. At this point, we have not done anything to increase that. We feel that we haven't had a lot of transactions. The only transactions we have in our system have been foreclosures and uh, transactions that we actually can't use by state law to set the assessment. So at this point, we did not do anything with the hotels. We feel that they're at least at market um, until we get more indications of that. So the other thing i would say is uh we've just recently seen this property um uh on a, an abatement and um even though he does have the income approach here we don't actually have uh any market support for the income approach itself uh the market approach or the income approach itself typically has to be uh supported with transactions that have occurred in this market where we're getting that information from them and actually establishing market from the the sales themselves. So again, uh, we don't have uh, any uh, market evidence here. Um, this is basically just the the investment value that's being presented. And uh, I guess the other thing that I would say, uh, you know, is that the property itself was uh, built in '15, um, and. Um, it's uh, th at that time they declared that it was about almost nine million dollars to build it. We have the property value at just under five million, um, and they also have a mortgage from 2015 for that amount. But that was part of the construction cost itself too. So at this point, um, we feel that the value is supported with the sales, the information that we do have, and that it is uniform. Thank you very much. Do we have any comments or questions from anyone? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. We have a motion. Do we second. have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. Moving on. 4300 20th Avenue South. 
Uh, sorry, that's 1632. Sorry about that. Once again, I'm going out of order. 1632, 42nd Street South, Delta Hotel. And I believe we have the same rep representative on the phone, so go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, this is the Delta Hotel. It's uh, built in 1995. It's 285 rooms. Uh, it's going to be a similar analysis on uh, this property as well, since it's a hotel property and income approach is the best like indicator of the property. Um, I've given you three years of the income. 73% um, for expenses. This is a full-service hotel, 5% of replacement for reserve, cap rate at 8%. Um, my adjusted market value comes out to 12300000 for this property. Um, if you look at page two, it's another three-year average. The average of the three years is 7026553 Using the same cap expense ratios, um, the adjusted market value of the three-year average is uh, $10,640,000. Uh, if you look at the actual income analysis, the actual income analysis will uh, will actually, uh, using their expense ratios minus the depreciation, the amortization, and the interest uh, from the P&L, and uh, using the 8% cap rate, it comes out to $12,590,000. Um, which is my opinion of value for this property based on the actual profit and loss of uh, the Delta Hotel. And the next few pages are the profit and loss statement of the Delta Hotel. And uh, the last page, page seven, um, you'll see another equity analysis, which is uh, the value per room. The value per room for the Delta Hotel is uh, 75388 the, uh, the other five hotels are upscale hotels in Fargo itself. The median is 68,161. Using the median with the number of rooms from the subject, the market value comes out to 12,609,806. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and Mike. Yes, uh, this is another one that we've seen re recently. We feel that the sales are supporting the value that we have on it, especially when we have the two uh, very comparable ones of the Radisson and the Holiday Inn selling. Uh, before, you can see before you, we've got the, the subject property at $75,000 per room, uh, and uh, the Radisson sold at 91000 and the Holiday uh, sold at 54000 per room. And so we're saying that, uh, you know, it, it's right in there. We're, we're very uniform. Um, the, the value is supported by the sales. And so we're recommending no change for this one. Very good. Any comments or questions? Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, 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 Mike, a general question for my clarification. The, the no, you mentioned and reminded us that we had taken a 15% reduction a year ago for hotels post pandemic. After that year, did it reset back into the levels previously, or did it reset down to that level, and are we continuing from the lower level forward? At this point, what we're doing is we're waiting for no, new, more new information. So right now, it's just saying at that level that we set last year, and um, what we like to have is you know some kind of information that's showing us that it's yeah it's coming back or or, or it's going up. You know, it needs to change or go down. You know, either way. So right now we're, we're waiting on more new information. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a motion. Do we have a sec second? We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mahoney? Aye. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Very good. Next one, 4300 20th Avenue South. OK. Um, this is the Staybridge Suites. This is an 80 room property built in 2005. Um, as you can see, it's been the same thing as the other properties. It's an income approach. Uh, it's an income producing property. So I believe the best way to value the property is by income approach. Um, the income the, the income for 2021 was $2,105,000. Uh, I've used 73% expenses or for replacement of reserves and an 8.5% cap rate. Um, the next page is the three-year average of the income. If you take the three-year average, it's a million nine hundred thirty-seven thousand. Using the same expense ratios and cap rates, uh, the adjusted market value comes out to two million nine hundred ninety thousand. And um, using the actual P and L of this property, um, 
the expense ratios are 70.8% with 4% of replacement for reserve and an 8.5% cap rate. Um, in my opinion, the value for this property is based on the actual P&L, the actual profit and loss. It's at 3850000 The next page is uh, the equity approach. Uh, it's going to be um, the value per room for the subject property is uh, 52000 and then 831 And the median is uh, 42680 And if you take the median with the number of rooms of the subject property, the adjusted market value comes out to $3,414,000. Uh, my opinion of value is going to be based off of the actual profit and loss at 3850000 for this property. And the rest is um, the actual P&Ls from the, from the hotel. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Mike, go ahead. So uh, with this property, again, you have the sales before you. Um, the appraisal theory does say that uh, for income producing properties, if you can get the information, it's the best way to value it. However, in... Uh, the absence of that information, then the sales is going to be the best. And typically, uh, for appraisal theory, sales is, is ge generally the best indication. Again, we don't have the income information. All we have is the investment value <coughs> for this property itself. We don't have any market transactions showing their income or what the indication of market value would be from those transactions. So we have the sales approach before you. It uh, supports the value uh, well, and uh, we're also showing that the competing properties are, uh, it's well, it's uniform and equalized, so they're being treated fairly. Any other comments or questions? O otherwise, we're ready for a motion. Do we have a motion? So move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. Next one, 5064 23rd Avenue South, four points by Sheraton. Do we have any? Yes, this is Lane Tannenbaum I'm representing the appellant. Very good. Go ahead. Well, we have, I've been listening, and we have another hotel property here. But I'd like to say that um, I think this one was purchased in 2019, and there, that was part of the reason why there wasn't a change to value. However, that's before COVID. And I understand they're saying that there's still more studies needed or information needed, but for a hotel property, it's bought and sold by the actual income expenses which we provided for the actual hotel. That's how hotels on the market basis are bought and sold. We have the actual income and expenses that we provided for you, and we use an income analysis actually at even a lower cap rate than the previous cases, at a seven cap rate. But actual income and expenses... Um, led us with a seven cap rate to a value of three million two hundred seventy-two thousand three one seven, and that's for year ending twenty twenty-one. So I don't know what more proof is needed than the of this actual property to say, look, um, there's still effects of COVID. There's still a lower value here as of one one twenty-two for the subject property based on actual income and expenses. And I don't know what more evidence is needed than that for a hotel property. That's what we have. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> so with this property, um, you have the write-up before you. Um, again, no uh, comparable sales were uh, given as evidence for a reduction in value. We do have a sale of the property in 2019 for $9 million, and the appellant is asking for three, uh, just uh, $3.2 million, $3 million uh, as the requested value. We currently have it at $6 million. Um, Again, uh, the, in, the indicated sales that we have uh, support the value itself, and uh, it's also uh, very comparable with the properties. It's being uh, treated uniformly, and so I guess at this point we're just uh, re uh, suggesting retain the value. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, uh, we are ready for a motion. So move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Very good. Motion carries. Next one, 4773, 32nd Street South. I don't know if we have a representative for that. It's a resident, so I'm guessing probably not. Not a highly compensated attorney. And so, Mike, go ahead. Okay. 
So uh, this property it, uh, came to us. They had some concerns about the valuation itself. Um, uh, it may, may have been actually due just to a large increase. As you guys know, the uh, city of Fargo, we did do a large increase for a lot of properties throughout the city just to keep up with the market. Um, we did review the property, and you have the sales before you. It's being treated fairly, and it's also very uh, supportable by the sales that we have. Do we have any comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. Next one, 5427. University Drive South, Unit D, a residence. Mike. Um, is, is there anybody that wishes to speak to this? Okay, uh, this property uh, came before us. They had some concerns about uh, how they were valued and, and how they were being uh, valued compared to their neighbors. We did take a look at that. Um, but for this property itself, um, we feel that the value is very supportable by the sales that we have before you. Almost all of the sales are their neighboring properties, and so we uh, suggest retaining the current value. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept the motion. Don't so, second. We have a motion on the second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. Next one, 3301 Broadway Apartment. Mike. All right. Uh, again, uh, this uh, was brought before us, and we did take a look at it. Uh, the applicant does did say that the apartments are experiencing a high vacancy rate. At this point, um, we have to consider what the market vacancies are, if they're... Uh, you know, for the particular properties themselves, if they are higher than market itself, um, then we would consider that, you know, possibly a management uh, issue or something along those lines, whatever the particular style of management of the owners themselves is. Um, but again, we don't use uh, income information on this because, again, we don't get the information. So we just uh, have the sales before you. It's supported, well supported by the sales that we uh, have on this type of property. Um, most of the sales are actually from 21. And um, again, it's uh, being treated fairly and equitably. Any comments or questions? I have a quick one. Actually, th this should have the highest occupancy in North Fargo because it's right next to the shack, which is the best place for breakfast in North Fargo. So I'm surprised that there's a high occupancy because if I have rented an apartment, that's where I would live. <laughs> that's just an editorial comment. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. 3501 Broadway, a mini storage. Mike? Yes, uh, so this is mini storage. Uh, again, uh, concerned about the value itself. But uh, when we took a look at the value the, of the sales that are occurring out there, it's well within that range. Um, this is actually a similar value to um, a, a, a reappraisal that we did three or four years ago, um, and the values were well supported at that time. So uh, I would just suggest to retain the value on this one. <clears throat> Any comments or questions? Otherwise, we will accept a motion. So moved. You have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. 201 35th Avenue North. Apartments. Mike? Okay. And this is the same owner again. Uh, the sales are su supporting the value, and the, uh, the uh, competing properties are showing that we have it uh, very uh, fair, and so uh, just to retain the value on this one again. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call, please. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Mahoney? 
Aye. Pepcorn. Aye. Motion carries. 4840 23rd Avenue North, the Gamma Building. Mike. Oh, oh you skipped Skip over. Skip one. 4034. I am very sorry about that. I missed another one. Okay. Uh, 4034, is that the one? Yes. 4034, 3rd Avenue North. Sorry about that. Go yes. ahead. So this is a warehouse type of property. On um, the commercial side, this is the one that the warehouse is what we get the most sales of. So uh, when it comes to these valuations, we're uh, pretty confident. It's also been the, the story that for at least six years, we've been trying to keep up with the warehouse sales. And um, every year we have to do increases. Just get, it's so strong. And so uh, we feel that the value is well supported on this one. Very good. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. 4840 23rd Avenue North, the Gamma Building. Mike. Okay. Is, it, what, is there anybody that wishes to speak to this one? Okay. Uh, this uh, We did a pro uh, walkthrough on this property just to make sure that we had the information correct. Um, the uh, site was reviewed and there were some things made that weren't, wasn't quite correct as far as the way we had it uh, as a uh, the classification of the building and the features that we had out there. Um, the uh, the initial value was uh, 17 million, and uh, there was a slight reduction. Um, yeah, okay. So the, the actually the the initial value was 17 million 759,200, and uh, once we made the adjustments for the information that we had incorrect, uh, the it goes down about almost 500 thousand dollars to the, uh, the suggested motion of 17275000 So Mike, can you just summarize real quickly what was, the, what was the changes and why were they made? So I believe what it was is we had the uh, large portion of the building was classified as medical office or clinic. And uh, when we walked through it, uh, we said, this is not medical office. It should just be regular straight office. And so the difference between those two in our system is basically the amount of plumbing. Obviously, in a clinic or something like that, you're going to have sinks in every room, things along those lines. This did not have any of that in, uh, the, that infrastructure in place. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? We will accept a motion. So moved. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. 4837 Amber Valley Parkway South. Mike. So in this building is basically connected to the last building. Um, it has been split um, for the different ownership. Uh, right now it's all under the same ownership, but pr prior to this it was on the, the two portions of the building were under, under different ownerships. Um, again, walked through this building and there was a <clears throat> some slight discrepancies. Um, we did do a reduction of 371000 on it uh, just to make sure that the information we had was accurate and we were doing an accurate appraisal on it. And so you have the recommended motion there before you. Thank you. Any, any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Mahoney? Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. Two, two items left. Uh, 4340 18th Avenue South, the Trustmark Building. Mike? So, uh, is there anybody present that wishes to speak to this? Okay, so this building uh, was brought before us. Uh, they thought the valuation was incorrect. Um, they bought it uh, back in, uh, what is this? 2020. Okay, 2020 they bought this one uh, for, I think it was just 6.1 million is the what they bought this one for. They did a, a 
extensive uh, remodeling to it for 3.8 million, and um, they're requesting that the value be set at 6.7 million. Um, at this point, we don't uh, agree that if you can do that amount of remodeling to a building and have the value uh, basically not go up. And so uh, based off of the sales that we have of similar properties, we're saying that it's supported and uh, that it's uniform with the other values that are competing. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept the motion. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Mahoney? Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. And the last one on the list, 3510 Park Avenue South. Mike? And this property, uh, is, uh, again, was uh, called us for concern about the value. We actually have some good support for the property uh, values on this one. And um, we uh, also... Um, we haven't done a lot of increases over the last few years um, the, for this property. Um, it's just a, he's uh, kind of has concerns each year about it. So we just wanted to bring this forward to show that um, the, the value is supported by, based off the sales of similar properties and uh, to retain the current value. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. So move. Second. Yep. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Strand? Yes. Preston? Aye. Mahoney? Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. I just want to say at the end of that list, it's so impressive. We have two residences out of all those. Uh, and, and can you talk a little bit, Mike, about the number of requests and how, if somebody calls in, how, how that system goes? Sure. So we had overall two, about 206 appeals uh, since we sent out the uh, increases of notice. And what happens is they call us and tell us our concerns. And then what we do is we will take a look at the property itself, make sure, again, that the information is correct. We did have, uh, an, and I'm going to be going through this, uh, the, a number of properties where we did have incorrect information. So once we got in there, we were able to change that information and in, in many cases reduce the value just because the information we had was wrong. We hadn't been in there for so long that we had incorrect information. Uh, so, and then the other thing we will look at is what is the market support for the value that we have on these properties? And if we can support it, we're probably gonna say, okay, we're not gonna change it. But if we can't support it, then we're going to drop it to what, you know, what we think is a supportable value based off of the sales that we have. So to summarize each year, you get individual requests, which is what you just talked about, but then also each year, then you go different sections of the city and then kind of review that whole area. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. We'll look at each area. Uh, there's the city's fit, split into five parts and uh, with each area that we're actually focusing on, we do a ground up reappraisal of the properties, uh, try to get as much inf in, uh, information that we can that's accurate. And, uh, and then start looking at the market and reappraise all those properties. So when you do each section, do you look at everything? So if, there, if it's residential and commercial or whatever it is, you look at everything in that area. Is that how it goes? Well, um, if right now that, that um, it's more for the residential side. The commercial is kind of on its own uh, okay. schedule. We do keep, keep the five-year rule with that, but it doesn't necessarily follow that, that same residential map. Okay. But uh, as far as the residential goal, yes, we do our best to, to try and look at all of the properties in that area. Okay. That's great. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, uh, Chairman, we'll go, I could ask. go ahead. Our, so Commissioner the 206 Preston? appeals, uh, how does that compare to previous years? Um, it, it's right in the, the ballpark. Uh, typically, we get somewhere between 1% and 2% of appeals based off of the amount of increased notices that we sent out. Okay. And so um, we're about one and a half percent this year. And how many increased notices do you send out? We sent out 14,300 14, okay. this year. And so, uh, yeah, about um, one and a half percent of the uh, uh, notices that we sent out got a response. A and, everybody, to us. and everybody gets that about every five years at the minimum or at the maximum, whatever. Everybody gets what amount? A an increased notice. Or does everybody get no, no, okay. um, it, no? It's the increased notice has nothing to do with the reappraisal. It has to do more with the the market itself. So um, 
Right, that's the, what I'm asking. Yes, so the area that we reappraised this year had about 6,500 properties in it. And we sent out 14,000 because we had to adjust citywide for the market itself. Okay, let me ask the question differently. So how often do you get around to every single house? About every five years. That's what I was asking. Okay. okay. Can I ask one more, not to get too, uh, but but so out of the about 200 that, and then do you go out and visit them out of that 200, about how many do you actually go in and re have, visit that property? Uh, we try to get into as many of them as possible, unless if we've been out there recently already. Um, so if we, you know, if we've had somebody like say in the last year or two years, we've been walked through it and they said, yeah, we haven't made any changes. We're pretty confident that the information we have, then we won't necessarily go out there. We'll just t check the market. Um, sometimes we'll go over the information that we have with the homeowner and, you know, see if they'll verify that what we have is correct. Um, but, um, we do try to get into as many of these as possible. Okay, very good, thank you. So we'll move on to number two, agenda item number two, the list of resolved appeals. Do you yep. wanna talk about that, Mike? Yep, so these are the uh, appeals that we went out and did the full process and the owner was okay with the, the value conclusion that we came up with. As you can see, we have uh, about 179 of these resolved appeals and of those 57% of them received a reduction of value of some kind. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the, for this, the suggested motion is before you just to uh, uh, re adjust or retain the values as re recommended by city staff on that list. And we kind of asked a few questions ahead of time on this one, but if there's any other uh, comments or questions, otherwise we'll accept a motion. So move. Second. Yeah. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Strand. Yes. Preston. Aye. Mahoney. Yes. Pepcorn. Aye. Very good. Uh, number three, the list of unresolved appeals. Mike. Okay, so this is basically just a list of all the ones that we just went through, all the individual appeals, and we actually have motions on those now, so we, can, we don't have to do this one. So we'll just skip to the next one. I love skipping agenda items, Mike, so whenever you want to do that, you let me know. Okay. Number four, list to be forwarded to the county board of equalization. Mike. So these are the parcels that uh, we were not able to get to because of timeliness. Um, in this case, this year, typically we have a few that we just can't get to because of the sheer volume. But uh, this year it actually uh, was more of uh, the time of the homeowners where they weren't in town or what have you, just these situations where we were available but they weren't. So um, it's about uh, t 10 parcels that are going to be forwarded to the, to the County Board of Equalization. And what will happen is they will have to contact the, the county assessor and then he'll refer back to us for any recommendations that we have on these properties. So we're still going to be working with these people, but it'll be the decision will be made by the county board. Can you ask me about their timeline just to kind of, and how this all goes with that, if you, if you don't mind the yep. appeal so, process. Go ahead. Yep, after this board, um, the, the county board is January or June 6th. And so at that time between now and then, they need to contact the county assessor, say, I want to appeal my values, and then he'll work with them from there. Can I ask you a question? Do you have a good relationship with the Cass County Assessor? Yes, I, I do. <laughs> no, that's good. I, I was just curious. So I don't know if anybody else has any uh, comments or questions. Or, uh, Mike, if you have anything else to add? Nope, just the suggested motion before you. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further comments or questions? Roll call, please. Preston? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Pepcorn? Aye. Motion carries. And the last item on the agenda, number five, Mike. This is just to close the 2022 assessment, say that um, everything is equalized in your guys' opinion, and to close it down so that we can start the next year. So move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? second. Motion and a second. second. Any further comments or questions? Just want to thank everybody. I, I want to go back to that. I mean, it's very impressive. Uh, your the staff, our, our assessor staff, you guys do a great job, and you're on the front line. So thank you for all you do. Uh, I think you take a lot of the hits and arrows for for sometimes what the commissioners do or say. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. And with that, go ahead, Commissioner Strand. Roll call. 
Yeah. Very sorry. You know what? When I get talking, come on, John, don't <laughs> interrupt me. I was Somebody on a roll. put a quarter in you today. <laughs> roll call, please. Preston. Aye. Mahoney. Aye. Strand. Yes. Pepcorn. Aye. We are, adjourned. we are adjourned. Not quite, Come Mr. on, Chair. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. You I, know, I, just help me understand before we wrap up, Mike. Um, with regard to hotels, we post pandemic reduced them 15% in their valuations, and that new base can, can, carries forward. That is, I'm, I'm correct on that? Well, Again, I would say that when we made the reduction, it wasn't necessarily due to the pandemic itself. It, it was due to the market information that we had. Okay. Um, and so, again, we were saying that we were high, not because of because the indications that we had were were pre pandemic. So, so, so the question I'm getting to is, is we don't, as I see it as a rule or as a practice, go the income approach analysis approach for properties like hotels. Am I correct on that? Correct, yeah. It's, and not that we can't, but it, it, we don't do it very often at but all. But it wouldn't be a, it, it's not something you just do occasionally. You either do it all or generally you have to have a general practice. Um, it really depends on the information that we have. Um, so it's, um, at, at this point, when we took a look at it, we were having in, we were seeing those indications um, based off of information that we had, um, and and with the sales themselves as well, showing that we are a bit on the high side. Okay. And so um, it's I think it what the other thing that we can do is when we start looking at we're looking at that three year average based off of the information we had from the um, the um, um, lodging tax itself. What we can do is we'll do another three-year average um, to see where that is coming in for the current year and see if it, it's indicating that we should be adjusting the values at that point. And I'll finish, then I'll, then I'll finish. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where this goes uh, and what we'll see in hindsight. You know, a lot of businesses had um, idle loans, grants, advances, PPPs that were not taxable, not part of income. So I would guess that would really skew potentially their their analysis of, of cash flow or profits. If, if But I'd be curious how that all shakes out through time is more of just a note. But a lot of, a lot of I'm guessing a lot of these businesses really had an immense engagement with programs to help them financially get through too. And it's maybe not always reportable taxable income. Can I ask a question here? So are you planning on continuing on with the income analysis with hotels? Um, because maybe, certainly their income has popped up quite a bit. Um, I don't know if we've looked at it yet this year. I know that we are tracking it, as we always have. Um, and the lodging taxes, I believe at this point, are well up. I think we're even above um, pre, we're above pre-COVID-19 uh, numbers. So it's something we definitely probably look at this summer and see if, if we, again, if we need to adjust the values. And hopefully we'll also get some sales to, to have more support for what we do. So we'll have a lot of appeals probably at that point. Well, we, <laughs> we've been dealing with hotels for the last year and a half. So, uh, you, know, um, you know, I mean, it's going to be the same old story until we get new information. So.